So I'm going to read something that Nietzsche wrote in the first part of Beyond Good and Evil, which is a section called Prejudices of Philosophers. And it's a really good example of the density of this book. One of the ways of conceptualizing Beyond Good and Evil, and I think this is true for most great works of it's true of most great works, is that the author of the work collects, unconsciously collects patterns from his or her interaction with the world and then gives them initial formulation. And the patterns can be deep and multi-level. The initial formulation translates them into not so much ideas as into the seeds of future ideas. And the more poetic the author happens to be, the more the case that his or her writings contain within it the seeds of future ideas. And for the romantic philosophers or authors, some sense it's beyond parallel. I mean, often if I'm reading a book, if it has any utility at all, I'll mark it. Usually I fold over the top of the page or sometimes put a yellow sticky note on it if I find a place where there's an idea that's worth returning to that, that's, uh, that's particularly worth understanding. And you can't do that with a book like Beyond Good and Evil because what ends up happening is you have to mark every sentence. Obviously, marking it every sentence isn't any better than not marking any sentences at all. So, I guess I also want to know why it is worth going into the book like this at all. Because it's a very difficult book. It's also the sort of book that can rattle you up. So, Nietzsche. is the world made of, or even how does the world function, which are more, in some sense, more specifically scientific questions, but how is it that you should conduct yourself, how should you act, people act towards aims, in a sense, as we're talking to creatures, and they're moving from one point to another, we're moving towards things that we want, and that means that we're guided by our desires, not only guided by desires insofar as we have individual desires, we're guided by the structure that consists of how those desires are related to one another. So, for example, if you have a room full of people, say a room full of children, they're active and they're each pursuing their individual desires, but at some point they may choose to organize themselves into a game. society and within that micro society they're deciding what desires will be currently expressed and how they'll exist in relationship to one another and that means that they can 
cooperate without too much conflict and that they can jointly move towards um, a joint aim without and, and, and gather all the benefits that might be associated with that and that might be the accomplishment of the aim whatever it is but it also might be just the enjoyment that's to be had in the pursuit of that activity now people do that socially because we have to do that in order to get along with other people because our desires have to be melded with those of other people but we also do it psychologically and those two things exist in a dance because as I'm interacting with other people the demands of the fact that we're interacting make require each of us to arrange our desires in a way that's acceptable to everyone else but at the same time, while we're doing that, we're also observing the process by which those desires are ordered, and then we internalize that process and use that to order our own desires. And then, so there's a constant, mutually informative dance between the individual and the group, and the culmination of that is the organization of society and the simultaneous organization of the psyche. And it's that process that Nietzsche is talking about in these paragraphs. Now, you might ask yourself, well, what's the utility of articulating such things and conceptualizing them and understanding them? The answer, in some ways, is straightforward. If you don't want to run afoul of your own desires, you have to organize them. Because some of them are short-term and some of them are medium-term and some of them are long-term. And some of them aim at this, and some of them aim at that, and it isn't necessarily the case that those desires allow for mutual fulfillment. So, for example, maybe you're very interested in pursuing a sexual relationship with someone, but you're also very interested in having a family and some stability in your life. Or maybe you're interested in pursuing a sexual relationship with a whole sequence of people, but you're also interested in having a family and stabilizing your life. It's not obvious that those desires can exist in the same universe without producing what you might think about as war. Some of that might be a psychological war, but some of it's also going to be a war that actually occurs in existence while you're fighting through the contradictory consequences of wanting to pursue many people and forming a stable relationship with one person. Part of the reason that you want to think about these sorts of things is because if you think about them and get your thoughts and your value system intelligently and coherently and cogently laid out, then when you act out that value system, you're going to run into less conflict and less uncertainty and less misery and you're going to have a higher probability of getting what it is that you want but you're also going to have a higher probability of getting what you want in a way that allows you to cooperate with other people without entering into too much conflict with them and so in some sense the purpose that you think the reason that you think or the purpose of thinking is so that you can sort out how you're going to move forward in the world without having to directly run headlong into all the obstacles that you might run into if you were doing such a thing blindly. And so then you might ask yourself, well, why would you bother reading philosophy? Philosophy written by someone who's great. And the answer to that is, is that they can help you think these things through in a manner that you would not be capable of doing on your own. made him a 